Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the last 101 of 2023. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about organizing 101. Uh, we ended 2023 in our with our original three workshops. Uh, we did uh, Green Party 101 in October, Eco-Socialism 101 in November, and we're closing out the year today with organizing 101. Uh, you can go to greensocialist.net slash 101s um, to see past versions of all of these, um, all the workshops we've been doing for the last two years, uh, including slideshows. Um, and then these original three 101s, if you go back to 2022, uh, you can see some really, really long, you know, two, three hour workshops where we were really committed to not uh, caring if we were long so that we could, you know, whittle things down uh, into what we, you're going to see today, which is about an hour long uh, organizing 101 workshop. Um, so yeah, you can go to greensocialist.net slash 101s uh, to see those. Another thing I want to bring up before we get going is I just put a link into the chat, um, but if you go to that website right at the top of it, you're going to see a link to a survey. Uh, we want your help figuring out what we're going to do in 2024. Like I said, in 2022, we did three workshops. We repeated them four times, um, and we went long. Uh, in 2023, we've narrowed them down, so we've got each of those original three down to about an hour. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we've done a whole bunch of tangential issue ones like uh, independent politics, decentralization, workers' rights, uh, ranked choice voting, and other democ democracy reforms. Um, so you can check all those out uh, there. But we want your you know, input going into 2024. What kind of topics would you like to see us cover in our one-on-one -on -one series? Um, what, you know, any format changes, anything like that? Um, you know, we're interested in hearing what you have to say. But uh, you know, to get started, I guess, my name is Chris Blankenhorn. Um, I'm a former Green Party of the United States National Co-Chair and currently the Secretary of the Illinois Green Party. I also uh, lead the education working group for the Green Socialist Organizing Project uh, that puts these workshops that you're seeing tonight on. Um, but from there, I guess uh, let's roll into it. Um, as you, as I go through, I'm going to be watching the chat. So if you've got a comment, um, I will either you know jump in you know if it's something that's relevant right now right then and i see it i'll i'll try to integrate it directly in as i'm i'm going through the workshop um if it's a little bit up tangential i'll uh, wait till a good stopping point or until if I, there may be cases where i know we're going to kind of talk about it later um but this workshop tonight is meant to talk about organizing from the bottom up right as green socialists, as independent socialists, we do not have uh, the resources, right, to play the game the way that the Republicans and Democrats uh, play. We're going to see an election coming up that's going to see billions of dollars spent. Uh, we don't have billions of dollars. Uh, it tends to come from uh, advocating for a system that doesn't, uh, you know, allow billionaires. Um, so, you know, today we're going to be talking about how to how to do grassroots organizing, and not the, you know, the what's called astroturfing that the major parties do, where they make you feel like it's grassroots, but it's still top-down directed. Um, you know, if we're gonna really change things, if we're gonna become a political alternative, we have to start in our local communities. We have to build bottom up, right? We don't have the money to compete top-down like they do. What we are going to have to leverage is people power. Um, one thing I do wanna say before I dive into this is that when you start looking into grassroots organizing, um, and, and the kind of the research and the, the training materials and the resources that are out there, what you're going to find out is that there's a really limited supply of resources oriented towards independent grassroots organizing, right? When you run into, you know, organizing materials that are often oriented towards the not-for-profit sector, they're often oriented towards, um, you know, Democratic Party front groups and after astroturf groups. Uh, they're often organized towards union and workplace organizing, which is, again, is often top down. Um, so there is no real clear playbook, right? There's bits and pieces. And obviously the, the strategies used in those other orientations uh, have some things that we can take from, take and learn from. Um, but a lot of things have to be adapted. A lot of things have to be kind of put together as a collage um, to create a you know cohesive organizing uh, framework for bottom-up grassroots organizing. So 
we're going to talk about a lot of things. Um, we're going to cite a lot of pieces, and we may not necessarily agree with the overall or overarching, you know, um, perspective or orientation of the piece or of the author. Um, but we think that it has something important for us to, you know, kind of think about as we're organizing in our communities. Um, so to start out, um, I really want to start with some affirmations, right? In the, the this. Uh, when you get into you know grassroots independent organizing, you're faced with a world that needs nearly total change and a lack of resources. So it really, really can be hard to take that first step. Um, it can really, really feel overwhelming, and that's that's not a, a failing. That's that's by design of our system, right? Um, but when I wanted to start out with some affirmations to just kind of drive home the idea that you can. Right. And so to start that off, no one needs permission to begin organizing in their communities. You can do it right. You don't need permission to start doing this. You don't need if you're in a, a local Green Party or there is no Green Party um, and you don't have that official structure to say, yes, let's do it. You don't need that. Right. You can start doing it. If you have a local Green Party that's stagnated, that's current membership isn't doing anything, that's current membership is adverse to, you know, actually getting involved in community organizing, um, then just start doing it. Right. And very quickly, you'll like you can find yourself having enough people to influence it. Right. All of a sudden they they're, you know, the. The people who don't want to do the work are going to be faced with a get on the train or be left behind situation. So you don't need permission to start organizing in your own community. Um, I think it's really important to remember your own community, right? Don't go airdropping in on a white horse into someone else's community. Start with yourself. Start around, start in where you live. Um, good organizing is built first and foremost on trust and relationships. Uh, working class people rightfully don't trust politicians actions not words are what matters right when and i hear this every presidential cycle right if, if people would just vote because the green party platform is all about green because the green party platform is awesome we would have x result well the reality is the green party is a political party right and our platform is our political promises um and the working class has been lied to year after year cycle after cycle for decades and longer right and so we can't just expect people to take us at their at our word right even if we really do mean our word they've had a lot of people ask them to take them at their word and at time every single time they've been let down right so we have to build trust and real relationships with people in our community that's how we grow that's the key to us actually seeing you know becoming a viable alternative um Kind of like what I said at the beginning, don't let yourself get overwhelmed, right? It's okay and, and pre pre it's preferred to start with one or two things and start with one or two things that are within your grasp, right? If you start organizing and your goal is to overthrow capitalism, man, like, right, we, we've really set ourselves up for a failure in that case, right? And that's not to say that capitalism shouldn't be overthrown or that organizing isn't the way to do it. But if that's goal number one, right? You're just staring up the cliff. There's no steps to lead you there. There's no ladder to climb. It's just a massive leap to the end goal. And so when you're getting started, um, pick some things that are accessible, pick some things that are important to your community, right? If you're interested in climate action, um, don't start with the COP28 countries and, um, you know, legislation to stop uh, you know, to, to meet scientific deadlines, which still say 2030, despite political deadlines moving well beyond that, right, in terms of when we need serious climate action, uh, when we get to when we need to get to that zero, uh, you know, emissions. Um, don't just so if you're into climate action, don't start with that, that those high level things start with something you, you can do in your community, right? Um, thinking about it in my community, businesses almost never recycle. And that's because me and me and the people you know the residents of our community actually have subsidized recycling um where our city helps pay and it's just part of our trash program but businesses aren't offered that right so that's something that's more attainable that you can get in talking to you know more progressive leaning businesses and get them on your side and you can have that win and once you get a win then things can really start snowballing so don't get overwhelmed don't start with too many things right you know we need to deal with things you know we need to deal with issues of peace we need to deal with issues of economic insecurity. We need to deal with issues of police violence. We need to be, deal with issues of colonialism. We need to deal with issues of workers' rights, right? I could keep going and going and going. 
when you're getting started, you can't address all of them. And there's an urgency that makes you feel like you need to address all of them, but you, sh you don't fall into that trap, right? Don't let yourself get overwhelmed. Start with one or two accessible things and grow from there. Um, once you, you know, pick those one or two accessible things, make sure you do the prep work and planning. If you're always shooting from the hip, it's hard to be effective, right? When, when Greens have a problem and uh, independent socialists have a problem of, um, you know, our hearts getting in the way of good organizing, we just have to act, we have to do something. And it, it means that we're just constantly shooting from the hip. We're constantly organizing on the fly. And that means that we're constantly organizing in an inefficient manner. Um, so we need to, you know, do that prep work, do that planning, make sure that you're thinking things through, decide on measures and metrics to determine if, the, if something is successful. And, you know, if you're talking about anything in the realm of electoralism with a third party or an independent campaign, that doesn't necessarily mean win, right? You can build up to that. Like we said before, you know, don't get overwhelmed. Don't start with your targets too high. Another good thing to remember is you're, you know, getting started and you're looking at what other people are doing. There's no one method to organize. If there was a way that did left, you know, independent socialist organizing, we wouldn't be in the state we are, right, in a, as a society and as a world right now. The reality is none of us has figured it out. We need multiplicity of tactics. We need radical solidarity where, where we support each other. But there's no one way to do it, right? Learn and adapt ideas from others. Do what makes sense for you and your community and your goals, right? What environmental action looks like in somewhere like Pittsburgh versus Chicago versus, you know, rural uh, the rural plain states or the rural Midwest is completely different. Um, so just because something's working somewhere else, that's not to say you shouldn't take it, but when you, when you, you need to adapt it to your local conditions. Um, and then, like I said earlier, there's very few resources on this. Uh, most are oriented towards not-for-profits and advocacy group groups. So don't be able to be afraid to try new things. Don't be afraid to ask for help. So to kind of start shifting, you know, into the actual, you know, what is organizing, let's ask the question, what is organizing? And here's a couple of thoughts on it. Um, organizing means engaging with the society, doing, not just thinking or talking. And that comes from the Green Party United States organizing tools on their website. Uh, it's linked right there. From Lee Staples, who we're going to hear from uh, later with uh, from their, their piece, Roots to Power. Uh, organizing is bottom up a bottom-up philosophical approach to social change, not simply a method to achieve it. And then from Abby Hoffman, a famous Yippie uh, that was active during the civil rights and anti-war movements, uh, the key to organizing an alternative society is or to organize people around what they can do and more, more importantly, what they want to do. Um, so the first two are kind of oriented towards, you know, this isn't just post, you know, advocating. This is a step beyond that, right? This is action. This is, you know, it's organizing. It is what it is. And then that bottom one, I think, is really, really important uh, for people when they're getting involved in organizing, right? If a new person shows up to your meeting, first thing that's absolutely essential is you have to have a way for them to engage. If they show up, they sit through a boring two-hour-long business meeting of inside baseball, and they say, okay, what can I do? And you say, I don't know. You just lost that person, right? There's a high chance they're never going to come back. You wasted their time. So make sure you have something to do. But not only do you need to make sure you have ways for people to be engaged, you need to have ways for people to engage in ways that, you know, either, you know, elevate their skills and abilities or, you know, trigger their passions, right? If, again, if, if I come to your meeting and I'm like, hey, what can I do? And you're like, Oh, well, we need some data entry done or we need, you know, if you have things that don't motivate me, um, I'm going to go find someone who does. Right. We're not the only game in town, um, you know, and so when you find a new person, you need to find ways to engage them, but not only just engaging them, but engaging them in ways uh, that are that are around what they want to do and what they can do. So we need to have, um, you know, a good spread of, of what people can do. And the good news is, as we said earlier, right, we're looking at, you know, 
overthrowing a you know a system of capitalism that means a total change in our society in our economy and our politics so there's no shortage of things for people to work on uh so when you're trying to you know identify those first few things one of the big questions is well what do we care about right because we don't want to choose something and then find out that no one's passionate about it and it just fizzles right if we can get find things to work on if we can find tasks if we can find actions if we can find you know engagement opportunities that really stoke people's passions that really uh lean on people's skill the people that you know are in the room already skills uh then we can use those to you know expand and grow so one thought one good way to think about organizing um comes from jane McAlevey and her her book no shortcuts um and she has an advocacy versus mobilizing versus organizing strategy um and Advocacy and mobilizing are directed at people who support your cause. Organizing is a strategic plan to win those over who don't agree, right? And I think it's important to say, right, we're going to divide these into these three points. We're going to talk about them kind of like three different letter, three different steps or different areas of, of operations. But we, we don't necessarily, just because we want to be organizing doesn't mean we don't ever advocate or mobilize, right? Um, we just need to be honest about ourselves with what we're doing at any given time, right? Is this really organizing or is it advocacy? But to advocacy, there's not necessarily a problem with that as long as we're not only doing advocacy, as long as we're not misleading ourselves by saying that the mobilize we're doing is organizing. Um, so we're splitting these up more so we can think about the work we do, um, who it's targeted at and what its outcome is, and not so much to say, don't do these other two, right? Because they all, they're all different tools in our toolbox. So advocacy is supporting others such as the union or an organization to create social change on your behalf, uh, based on the belief that an elite can influence the current system on behalf of the people. Yet it generally does not involve ordinary people or action and leadership, right? And so this is when, you know, you donate to this, you know, whatever not for profit that that supports what, uh, you know, an issue that you find important. Um, you know, you, you, you donate to Planned Parenthood and uh, you hope that they're going to use that money to protect reproductive rights, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with that, right? And there's nothing wrong with being an advocacy organization at times where your membership and your supporters put faith in you to do, uh, you know, to, to lead the change. But again, this is, you know, we're talking about grassroots organizing and advocacy is handing off you know, your agency, it's handing off your ability to make change to someone else. Um, so we need to keep that in mind when what we're do with what we're doing, right? Are we actually building the Green Party? Are we actually actually building an independent socialist socialist organization? Or are we handing off our power to someone else to wield however they want, right? And that's how we get betrayed in back rooms um, by deals between industry and, uh, you know, special interests. Um, the next one is mobilizing. Prote and most people have been involved in mobilizing in some way, protests, rallies, attending, speaking at city council meetings, inward base building oriented work, right? Um, it's limited to those who support your cause or the issue, uh, which often results in an informal hierarchy being formed that still leaves out a lot of people, right? Um, so even in mobilizing, there's always that core group of organizers that puts together the protest, right? That decides the scope, that picks the speakers, the location, the targets, the, all that kind of thing. Um, and again, it's all about your people, right? Who agrees with us on this issue? Let's get them in the streets. And that, again, that's not a bad thing. The more people we can get in the streets to apply public pressure and in strategic ways, the better. Um, but sometimes when we're doing this, we need to ask ourselves, where is this leading to? Right? We're building up all this energy in our mobilization, but where is that energy funneling into? Right? Where where does it and, and the scary thing is when you start asking yourself question these, this question in the context of American politics, you often find out the answer is the Democratic Party and voting and then it ends, right? Um, you often find out that, oh, a lot of these organizations that are mobilizing aren't actually mobilizing for radical transformative change, right? They're not advocating for, you know, democratization of our system. They're not advocating for liberation. Um, they're advocating for slow reforms. Um, and often, our, you know, the mobilization, all that energy just kind of peters out in the end because it doesn't have a vehicle for which to continue past the end of the protest. Um, and that's where organizing comes in, right? Organizing is actively working to change the minds of those who disagree with you and, or, or who are not engaged in your cause, right? Um, there's obviously a lot of people who disagree with us, but 
you know, when you think about third party independent socialist organizing, the largest voting block in most elections is non-voters, is people who aren't engaged in your cause. And mainstream politics will have you think that these people are lazy and apathetic. But the reality is they've been burned too many times, right? They they refuse to continue participating in their own destruction, right? They they have voted Democrat or they have voted for, you know, the person they thought would be the best representative for them um, out of the mainstream parties. And they've been stabbed in the back time and time again, right? They voted, their people won, and they are live on the ground, and the day-to-day -day life got worse. Um, and so that, you know, while we can obviously focus on changing people's mind, I would actually say this has been a failed strategy in the Green Party for decades. This idea that we can cleave off enough left Democrats to become a viable party. And the reality is the math just isn't there. You can't steal a minority of a minority party and reach a majority, right? That the, the math doesn't compute on that one. Um, so if we're gonna really build something, if we're gonna build an alternative path to become an alternative power, um, that that not engaged in the cause, uh, you know, demographic is really our bread and butter and where we should focus on. So as we start, you know, okay, so we've, we're thinking about what we're doing. We're thinking about, you know, the, we've thought we've, picked a few things so as not to overwhelm ourselves. We've um, kind of oriented our work towards local issues and local manifestations of global or systemic problems. Um, we've thought about, organ are we doing advocacy right now? Are we mobilizing right now? Or are we organizing right now and trying to change people's minds? Um, so as we're doing this, you know, we can start setting goals. Um, and here, there's a few uh, different ways to think about this. And again, we're taking bits and pieces from things and trying to compile them into something larger and we're doing it in you know we're kind of forging a new path in a lot of ways um so you know we've got three different ways and none of them are right and none of them are wrong and they all have applications that you know we may see them so the first one is from Miriam kaba uh questions i regularly out ask myself when i'm outraged about injustice right so this question comes in sorry i live by a train track um this question comes in right when we're starting, right? When something in our local community has us worked up so we can start asking questions, right? What resources exist so I can better educate myself? If you're not up to date on it, you need to get up to date on it if you're gonna take serious action. Who's already doing work around this injustice? Don't reinvent the wheel, right? If you're interested in a specific topic, who's already doing work in town, right? Who can you ally with? You don't have to join their group, right? But your green, your local green chapter can become an ally, can become a coalition partner around this issue. Um, do I have the capacity to offer concrete support and help? Uh, this is a question that I feel like Greens often skip over, um, and it comes from a good, you know, a good-hearted place where they just feel the need to act, but they don't act. They don't. We often don't pause and say, "But am I actually offering concrete support that brings a tangible result, or am I acting for the sake of acting? Right? Is this performative?" Um, and so we, that, that's the next one. And then, how can I be constructive? Right. Uh, Often time, like I said, you know, we're trying to tear down capitalism. Right. We're trying to, um, you know, overthrow colonialism and imperialism. Um, there are there is a level of destruction um, in what we're trying to talk about. And that's not to say, you know, physical violence and all those things that people think about. But we're talking about, you know, dismantling systems. Um, and so we need to also be thinking about how can I be constructive? Because after dismantling, there's always rebuilding. Um, and how do these things connect? What's the next step? Right. Um, if something if an action has a dead end, it may not necessarily be constructive and that may be OK, um, but at least be aware when you're when you're do, you know driving down this dead end, when you're organizing towards a dead end, that that's what you're doing and have a reason why you're doing it. Um, and then a couple from Lee Staples. It's good to ask, what are you organizing around? Because it'll change who you talk to, when you talk to them, how you talk to them. Right? Are you organizing around turf, which is geographic area? Are you organizing around an issue, an identity, or around a workplace? Right? How you go into each of those different situations is completely different. Um, you know, thinking about my local community, at any given time, I could, you know, if I wanted to make change, I could make change at the, at the municipal city level. I could make change at the county level. I could make change at the township level. I can make change. And this is just thinking, you know, let reforms through the legislative system. But I can make so city, county, township, state, and then federal, right? And then I guess we could say international. But again, 
we don't we want to keep our skill our scope and our expectations reasonable right but so think about how you're you know organizing what if i want to change something can it be changed by the city or does this have to be a state or a federal change right um legalization of marijuana is a perfect example of that we see state level action but there's still problems because of federal level inaction uh, and then also from lee staples this is a really good you know sentence to go through when you're thinking about an action who wants what from whom and how can it be accomplished right so who is your membership structure leadership and staff who who are we that want something your community members uh what the goals and objectives that, um you know what are you trying to gain whom is the persons or institutions you are acting again so you know i want to see this law changed who can actually change it you got to answer that question i have seen places advocate for things only to find out they don't have control over their you know organizations advocate for things only to find out the body that they're challenging doesn't actually have the power to do it they need to be challenging someone else and they didn't think it through so they're you know now now it's really hard to recover from that because you've made yourself look pretty bad and pretty unknowledgeable and then how right strategy tactics finances allies communications how do we actually achieve it right so what do we want and who can give it to us and through what you know method can we get it sometimes that's lobbying and for you know a law sometimes that's creating a pr situation that's really bad um right uh, governments hate nothing more than or you know not even governments governments corporations people in power hate nothing more than a you know a bad pr situation that they they could you know that they can't mitigate because then it's not about you know what they want it's about how things are being spun um you know an example i often give is i was a community organizer and we were doing a community cleanup um and the park district in my town was awesome they provided a trailer with all the materials we would need to clean up this neighborhood but when we called public works to ask where to put all the trash that we cleared from the alleys which again they should be that's their job to keep clean right the we're doing public works job by maintaining our communities and, and they are they are failing in that realm they wouldn't help us out and so we called and we called and we called and we called and they wouldn't ever answer us and so finally a few days the Thursday before our Saturday event, I called again one last time and uh, the director of public works wouldn't answer the phone and so I or wouldn't take the call. So I told the secretary, can you please leave them the message that we're still waiting to know where I need to put the trash. If they don't get back to us about where to put it, we will see them on Tuesday. We'll be holding, holding a press conference in front of City Hall before the city council uh, meeting on Tuesday night and we will have all of the trash dumped in front of City Hall. And our press conference will be about the failure of the city to maintain uh, community, the neighborhoods in the area of the community we were working. I've never gotten a call back so fast in my life with the location. And you better believe they picked that trash up before Tuesday, right? We solved that problem by pure creating a PR problem for one person, the one person who was blocking us and the one person who could actually change it just by the stroke of a pen and saying, just dump them on the city owned lot in the neighborhood. Right. So we'd figured out who we needed to pressure to get that change. And yeah, we could have went through city council and all that, uh, but we got the change a lot faster by acting the way we did by creating a PR problem. So who wants what from whom and how can it be accomplished? You know, in this kind of preparatory period where we're figuring out what we want to do when we're strategizing, when we're making sure that we're thinking through our tactics, targeting the right people, all of that, um, we need to do something that in business is often called qualifying the lead, right? Um, who is our likely base? We should have conscious discussions and strategies surrounding who do we want to be talking to? Um, you know, ask yourselves questions like, what do I care about and how does that impact the people in my community? Who are we in terms of what communities does my core group represent? Uh, it's important, like I said earlier, previously in the slideshow, you know, it's important not to try to save others, right? We don't need saviors, we need empowerment. That's what we need in our communities is to be empowered, not saved by someone riding in on a white horse from out of town, right? We don't need carpetbaggers and we don't want to be that. Um, so start where you are and grow outward. Strategize on how to become more inclusive, right? If you look around the room and say a big part of our community is missing, ask why, right? And at, do real thought, real, you know, and reflection because that's a failure on our part, right? If we don't have a representative body making up our membership, 
then we're failing as organizers. So what do we need to do? What do we need to shake up? Why are the things that we're doing missing these people that we want to be here that are part of our community, but who are being excluded both from the government, you know, both from uh, current systems of power and from our attempt to build an alternative. So start where you are. People often ask, where do I start your neighbor? Walk next door, have a conversation about the, you know, the state of your town, state of your community the neighbor on the other side, the neighbor on the other side, start expanding. Oh, skip, you know, now bounce a house. And this isn't one conversation, right? We'll kind of get into deep canvassing later, but this is about building relationships. This is about having long-term conversations, right? When you talk to your neighbor and they say, oh, you know, man, the roads and sidewalks in this neighborhood are really going to crap. In my community, I have a go-to for that. Oh, did you know that public works and the police department actually put in about the same budget proposal every year? Uh, the police department gets 99% of their budget proposal and public works gets 30%. We have shitty roads in our community because we're overfunding authoritarian policing, right? We, our job as socialist organizers isn't to preach is to listen and help people make connections, is to help them see that our roads suck because of our decisions that our city of government's making, and that because of the decisions that our state government's making involving funding and our federal government's making involving funding, right? It's our job to help connect these bread and butter issues, these everyday life issues, these kitchen table issues that people deal with and that run their lives and ruin their lives, right? and helping make them connections to the systemic changes that are underneath all, right? Climate, it can be directly linked to capitalism, right? You don't go start preaching anti-capitalism. You let them walk through the door and then they, you, you kind of turn the light on and say, you, you do, you know, help them make, see the, you know, the world for what it is and have that vision of, oh God, I'm already here. You know, you didn't have to turn them. The, the working class fully understands the oppression and repression of capitalism, even if they've been brainwashed by propaganda and mythology. Um, so who do we want to be represented in an organization? Um, you know, like I said, often political groups act as more as advocates for others than voices for their members. If, and so we need to change that. And then another big question that, I, that gets left out a lot is who has a material interest in change, right? If someone has a material interest in change, right? If that change will change their life, they're gonna be your ride or die organizer, right? To the extent, extent that they can, right? Because we're also talking about the working class. We have families, we have jobs, we have problems, right? And so we, we it's hard to, you know, organize in the working class because of that, right? We're exhausted from work. We're exhausted from raising families without support. We're exhausted from trying to exist in a system that oppresses us but we have an in material interest in change. And so we're the ones that are going to show up. We're the ones who aren't going to turn, who aren't going to accept an appeasement and a half measure, right? Um, most movements over in history have experienced the sellout that comes, right? From those who don't have the material interest, right? They, they, they get the offer of, well, I know you wanted an A, but what if we gave you B, which is a little bit like A, and that's when you have the people who are comfortable in their lives, but have an opinion on this issue, Go, okay, that sounds right. That sounds that sounds like a fair deal, right? You took a small step and we'll accept it. And all of a sudden the movement falls apart. And the people who needed material change in their lives are left standing there, abandoned by people who weren't, you know, who who don't have that material interest. And try, you know, and without the support and resources to continue the struggle. Um, so we really need to ask that. And it can be an offensive question to people, right? People get mad when you question, well, are you going to be here? Right. Are you really going to be here when when the fight comes? Right. They get mad about that question. And then it's silence when they actually don't show up. Right. It makes me think of the Occupy movement. In the spring of 2012, we were having our local meetings and I raised that uh, we needed to think about what to do when the Democrats abandoned the movement to campaign in 2012. And you would have thought I'd murdered some of their children with that suggestion. Well, two months later, they were all gone. Every single one of them was gone, right? And they're advocating for a neoliberal that wasn't going to change anything. Um, so we need to have these conversations. We need, and, and that question of who has a material interest is really important. Uh, people do not need, like I said, we don't need people to come in. They don't need someone to presume to speak for them. They need organizations built in their own community uh, for their own community's empowerment. We should strive to build bottom-up democratic organizations that are made up of our community, 
not speaking for them. Um, Jose asks where you can find this slideshow and everything. Uh, you'll find it in the next couple of days um, up at greensocialist.net slash 101. So we'll have the slideshow up on uh, Thursday. That it'll come out on podcast platforms, and you can find it on YouTube and stuff right now and, and continuing. Um, so on the next slide. So we're talking about, you know, qualifying the lead and who we should be talking to. When we're doing this, we also need to understand that we need to meet people where they are, right? We're going to encounter people at varying levels of engagement. Some people are going to like what we're doing from a distance. Some people are going to hit the ground running and organizing. Some people are going to be somewhere in between, right? And that's normal. That's natural. Um, people have different levels of availability and resources. People have different levels of knowledge and skills. Um, you know, people have different levels of commitment and we cannot get into, you know, playing these games of setting up a hierarchy of who cares more, right? I'm willing to commit, you know, 20 hours a week and you're only willing to commit five and therefore I can't, you know, I care more and my way, my voice should hold more weight. No. Again, especially when we're organizing in the working class, we need to offer a variety of ways to get involved and we need to get or, we need to offer a variety of levels that people can involve and we need to provide support for people when they do it. And that may mean something like, does your meeting have childcare? Because if it doesn't, you're excluding people with children, right? Is your meeting in a bar? Well, you're likely going to be excluding some people who don't want to be in that setting for whatever reason, whether it be the predatory nature that is often, uh, you know, inside or you know a core part of u.s bar culture or it could be because of the it could threaten their sobriety to meet in such a place or it could be because a bar and alcohol with alcohol is a terrible place to have political conversations and engagement especially if it's not a closed space right it's a little different when you're sitting around having a beer with your comrades but when you go into a bar you open up to the outside and you open up to you know people who are inebriated on the outside so you know think about where people can engage and you need to meet them where they're at so we should have multiple ways to engage with your chapters business meetings are not for everyone but that's the primary access point for the green party and we severely limit our new engagement right potential to get new members by doing that when the only way for you to get involved in the green party in your community is to show up at a meeting talking about things that you don't understand because you're new talking about the you know really deep inside baseball and mo frankly in most green party meetings I've been to having a very inefficient meeting that's not very respectful of people's limited time right but, but if we have multiple ways to get people involved we can cater to eat more easily cater to different levels of interest and different with different event types that can bring a broader community of people in right so you've got your business meeting those have to happen right they keep the the, the organization running um, education events are a great way to um, you know, to expand that. Social events are a great way to expand that. Protests and rallies are a great way to expand that. Um, open office hours where you can, you know, people can come in on a Zoom call or if you're into a person's home or if you're lucky enough to have an office into the office um, and work collaboratively, right? And, and work in parallel, work on the things together and have these conversations in a min more informal manner. Um, but people are more apt to get involved if they're in organizing, if there are opportunities that align with their skill set and passions. They're less likely to show up if they're simply tasked with a job that no one else is doing and they're not interested in. So you need to make sure you're engaging people in a way that are appropriate for their interest level and skill set. Um, one key way to you know keep this going is to develop a mentorship system where people who have experience doing certain tasks or performing certain roles work with other mem members to develop the necessary skills and train them to be able to do the work right in the green party and independent socialist organizing people are already wearing too many hats right you you have already have because we're low resources because we're you know grassroots we don't have enough people to do the tasks that we need sometimes and so we start putting on way too many hats um and it means way too many failure points it leads to burnout um and so if you're if you're the media director of your local chapter your state party um you know ask your membership does anyone have interest in learning how to do this, how to write press releases, how to follow up with press, how to build relationships, how to do social media, right? how to do effective graphics and copywriting, that kind of stuff. And when you have some hands raised up, say, okay, come on. It's going to take some of the workload off of you because you're going to have people helping. It's going to 
you know, pass along skills to them, and it's going to set you up with fail safes so that when um, you know something happens in your life or work really gets really bad, you know, really gets heavy on you for a minute, and you have to step back. Um, you're able to do that, and someone can step in, and you don't have to worry about it, right? Because this also, besides burnout, the other thing that us wearing too many hats tends to lead to is that we're afraid to say step back, right? And we go and we go and we go until it just falls apart. Um, part of being a good organizer is knowing when to say I need help. And it's hard to ask for help if you don't have, if you know there's not any there. So take an active role through a mentorship program of developing that fallback, of developing your backups. Um, and this is something that I 100% personally am guilty of, right? Um, but everyone's in a different phase of their evolution politically and as a, and, and as a third party. Uh, many people come to us as they are changing trajectories. That's why political education is super important and democratic processes are essential to work through political disagreements and develop a common foundation and perspective, right? So we need to meet people where they are. But we also need to provide the educate, you know, political education and clear democratic processes for how things work and how we make decisions so that we can get people to where we need them to be. Um, you know, the, the, that's a key part of it. Uh, I'd, I'd said earlier, this is a basic multi-engagement stream model. I, I threw it in a slide too early. But like I said, not everyone wants to be at a, vis at a business meeting. It is essential that we have multiple ways for potential supporters and members to interact, uh, both in long-term organizing and in initial access, right? When someone comes in initially, um, you know, the different things they may be able to do or may want to do or that you're willing to hand over the keys of, you know, for to someone completely new, it's different from someone that's engaged long term, right? So we need to move people through these steps, through these ladders, right? People, sometimes all someone wants to do is donate, and that's okay, right? But, and sometimes people, sometimes somebody wants to dive in full speed, you know, the first time they're there, and that's okay. And then, like I said in the previous slide, a lot of people are in between. So we've got to find that, you know, a way to kind of cater to all of those groups through different uh, access points and different engagement opportunities. So a basic multi-stream engagement model, I would I would recommend every Green Party local pick this up. Every single Green Party local should be at least doing the top three, if not all four, um, as consistently as possible. First off, like you said, the business meeting, right? This is where the operations of the party and official decision making takes place. It's important, but it can be boring and without proper planning and moderation, very ungainly. Uh, social events, green drinks, green social hour, social lighting with socialists, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's an event that's informal. It's intended to give people a low access point for engagement. People can meet and, and discuss green socialist politics in a relaxed setting, right? So you pick a local coffee shop and you say, we're going to have a, you know, a social gathering here from six to eight tonight. Uh, people can come out, they can talk. There's no pressure to join. Uh, you're just learning a little bit more about us in a informal setting where you can have those one-on-one -on -one interpersonal conversations that actually change things, right? You very rarely is someone uh, mind changed because of a social media point post or because of arguing in the comment section, right? Um, very rarely, we, we know from research and data, yard signs aren't changing people's minds. They just make the people who got the yard sign feel like they're doing something when all really all they did was put a piece of paper that doesn't change minds in their yard, right? Um, those things, you know, what, what actually does change people's minds, what actually does get people to take a deeper step is one-on-one -on -one conversations, is interpersonal relationship building and trust. Um, and so this is, a, you know, somebody just comes because they're, hey, I'd like to learn more about you. Um, and this is where you can have those initial, initial conversations. And then you say, hey, come to our educational event in two weeks and learn about, you know, what is the Green Party? Um, and now they're a little bit more. And then they show up in the next social event and their questions are a little deeper. You know, like, what, what could I, what are we working on? You know, and then pretty soon you're able to transition them into an active organizer. Um, like I said, educational events, panel discussions, workshops like this one, film screenings. Um, educational events allow great opportunities to collaborate with other organizations in your area, which means you're spreading the workload and, and also gaining access to potential supporters that you might not otherwise, right? 
when you want to talk about an environmental issue in your area, look for SAGE on your local university campus. Look for this local Sierra Club to partner with. Look for Extinction Rebellion to partner with, right? When you're um, going to be talking about racial justice, look for immigrants' rights organizations in your community that you can partner with. Look for the, your local BLM in your community that you can partner with. And when you partner, you're all sharing, right? And so when they show up, they get to hear, wait a minute, there's a political party that stands for the things I believe in? They might not have known that before, but because the Green Party partnered and did this educational event, now they know that there actually is an electoral arm, electoral power that supports these things instead of just holding their nose and fighting, voting for a lesser evil like most politically active people in this country do. Um, and then the fourth one is uh, rallies and direct action, organizing a rally, a protest, any other kind of public advocacy or mobilization event around an issue. Uh, this can be in, uh, another opportunity obviously to connect with other movements and it lets people see that you know you're in you're in the streets with them you're shoulder to shoulder you're fighting for their struggles you're showing up when they have an issue that they want raised um so they let you mobilize your base they keep your base active you can meet and you can meet new and potential members who again find out there's a political party that agrees with them on these issues um, <clears throat> and by offering multiple access points to the party, you widen the scope of your potential members or supporters that you have access to. Uh, the organizing and execution on these of these various outlets also provides a wider range of ways to get involved, right? So while the, the social event and the education event and the rally um, help you meet new people, it also gives a way for people to get involved, right? Someone who doesn't want to go to the rally, who you know, a little who's a little more. Um, introverted and doesn't want to go to a rally or the social event may be great on research and you know uh, you know developing curriculum for your educational events and then vice versa right someone that doesn't want to sit in a meeting or sit through a workshop is going to be great to help organize your social events or, or you know get a rally to go together and going so on this base i really encourage all green part all local chapters and state parties as much as possible to you know at least adopt a multi-engagement stream like this um there you know especially when you think about it the business meeting is kind of runs itself for most parties once they're established a social event is really simple it's really low-key it's not a big resource sink it doesn't take a lot of time to organize educational events are um that are a little heavier, but once you get in the groove, you find out there's so much to cover, right? And it actually becomes pretty easy. Um, and then the rally and the, the direct action organizing, you know, obviously is a, it, it, it uh, appeals to a different kind of person, but that's generally a, a kind of person that you want, right? That's an organizer. So um, this basic stream model gives you multiple ways for people to engage. It makes your party look active um, and it lets you meet a whole bunch of new people. We've talked, I've said the word relationship and trust, uh, the phrase relationship and trust a lot. Um, and that's because it's, it's really, really key. As Howie says, uh, do more listening than preaching when you're talking to people. And this brings us to the idea of deep canvassing. Um, deep canvassing, or is also called relational organizing, um, is about having long, repeated conversations with, or, with voters and community members to build trust and good relationships that may eventually shift opinions, even if they don't uh, initially agree. There's research out there about it. Uh, Calla and Brookman uh, show that door-to-door -door canvassing, which is you know what you tend to see during the uh, mainstream elections from the major parties, where you know they knock on your door, they talk at you a bunch, and they hand you a piece of paper telling them why they should vote for you they have almost nearly zero effect on voting choices. They rarely change people's mind. Um, both parties tend to only knock the doors of the people that are already on their side, right? It's a mobilized, it's voter turnout. It's not organizing and changing minds. Um, but research has shown that it, it really doesn't uh, have a big impact on people's voting choices or their actions. However, deep canvassing does have measurable effects. Um, in fact, one study in particular found that 10 minute conversations have had an impact on reducing transphobia, right? Because when you just tell them, you know, transphobia is bad, you know, do this thing and you walk away, you didn't have a conversation, you didn't address their concerns. Whether those concerns are rational or real, reasonable or anything, People aren't going to change their mind if their concerns aren't addressed, right? But in a 10-minute conversation, you can get to some of that. You can counter some of that. And you 
through repeated 10 minute conversations, you can actually move that, you know, move people on things. Um, and it's more effective than any other form of outreach, flyers, mailers, speeches, rallies, etc. cetera. Um, you know, another area where this comes in, it would be a turnout for events, right? Uh, you know, you post on Facebook, you send an e-blast, you maybe put up some flyers around town, but none of that's gonna be as effective as phone banking and door knocking to the people that you want to show up and saying, you know, can you, will you commit to going? Um, you know, that this, the one-on-one -on -one conversations are where it's at. It's where you get the return, um, you know, in terms of, of, of uh, turning people out and engagement and outreach and changing people's minds. Um, some tips on deep canvassing. It's got to be more than one contact, one encounter. Repeat contact, do check-ins, right? You talk to them a few weeks ago, go see how things are going. And you don't jump, you don't, you know, we're I'm talking about organizing in your community. So you don't have to jump straight into, you know, oh, so about that vote we had, you know, we were talking about. How's their family doing, right? How's work? How's, how are their holidays? You know, that kind of thing. What are they, what are they doing for New Year's? And, and get into the deeper stuff, right? Um, one way I often talk about this is, um, you know, you start talking to someone and they, you know, they complain about an issue in your community. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and as a good socialist organizer, you make some connections. Um, you have another conversation. You keep meeting those connections. Then a few, you know, a few months later, you're like, hey, you remember that thing that you're talking about? We're actually going to have some people going to city council, um, you know, and speaking about it. Well, I'm not asking you to speak, but you want to come with us and show that we have support. So now all you're asking them to do is go downtown and sit in a room for an hour. Um, and you've talked about it and that, you know, they know where you're at. They know, you know, where they're at and they, they, the way higher chance that they're going to show up. Right. And then a few months after that, they may be the one speaking. Right. And a few months after that, they may be organizing a rally. But you had to start those conversations. You had to take it through step by step by step. Um, you know, one of the real keys in grassroots organizing is you can't jump straight up to the top because then when you do that, you start astroturfing and you start top down organizing, right? You, you betray the system. Um, so it's gotta be more than one encounter in terms of electoralism. This means you don't start in an election year, right? Uh, if the, the kind of work we're talking about is long-term. It's a years long process. Um, Listen to their people's concerns and relate those concerns to your platform and systemic problems. Uh, don't put the voter on the spot with leading questions. Ask what their concerns are. And then over time, like I said, you move, you, add, you make small asks and you move folks up to that, that ladder of engagement. And some people may max out on their ladder of engagement, right? All they're going to do is this. That's fine. Don't chase them away because they won't take the next step. You know, you can continue to pro apply some light pressure, check-ins and all that, um, but don't try to make people do things they're not comfortable with. Some recruitment methods, right? As I've said, we're grassroots organizers, so we need to grow. Growing bottom-up, growing in our communities is the key to seeing state-level, citywide success, state-level success, national-level success, and global success, right? We got to start at the bottom get to the point where we, we can elect thousands across the country to, you know, of Greens and independent socialists to local office. And that's going to be the springboard which gets us into state legislatures, which gets us into Congress, which, you know, has us, uh, you know, challenging, you know, actually becoming a real spoiler um, and providing real challenges on, on national level elections and things like that. So recruiting methods. Um, this is from Organizing Methods in the Steel Industry by William Z. Foster. Uh, you may say, Chris, that, that piece is 100 years old. Um, how relevant could it be? Um, well, I will say that uh, this was the organizing guide that was uh, heavily leaned on by the Amazon workers in um, Staten Island who successfully won their unionization vote. Um, getting, you know, ignoring some the fact that they don't have a contract Right. They've, they've won their vote, but they haven't been able to get a contract and the internal problems they've had. And, you know, they've been having with organizing since the win. They got that first win and they got it using the centuries old text. Um, so organizing methods in the steel, steel industry by William Foster. A uh, few different ways that we can get go about it. Right. Individual recruitment, uh, which is especially using the chain system where members recruit their friends and neighbors as new members, right? Um, basically a pyramid scheme, <laughs> but a pyramid scheme for socialism. Um, you know, what, what you're gonna do is when you get an engaged member, hey, um, you know, you've been organizing 
with us, you know, you've been re doing really good work. Do you know anyone else, um, you know, that, that might want to get involved? Uh, and, and that's your chain system, right? Uh, the, the easiest way to double membership in your, in your organization is to ask everyone to bring a friend. Right. And if they all succeed, you've doubled your membership with very low, you know, resource requests on any one individual's part. Um, so this chain system of individual recruitment, uh, then you've got open recruitment, inviting people, the public to meetings, uh, have current members immediately ready to enroll, enroll people. Um, you can invite new folks to an onboarding before the meeting or pull them aside uh, during part of it where while other business is going on to kind of when you identify that person you think is really interested in. Um, you know, you want to reel them in, you want to have that more engaged conversation. Um, you're much better off having that conversation and spending your time talking to the person that's on the fence, that's leaning your way, than arguing with the person that opposes you, right? That person that you're arguing with is just sucking all the air out of the room. And while you're fighting with them, someone who might have been, you know, a five minute talk away from getting involved just walked out the door because you were so distracted by winning an argument. Right, we're way better off when we're having these public meetings, targeting those people that aren't, you know, and, and again, that's not necessarily organizing, it's mobilizing, um, but we're trying to grow in this situation. So, um, you know, when we have these meetings, when you have your educational events, when you have your social events, you know, just because it's a social event doesn't mean there shouldn't be someone there ready to collect names, phone numbers, email addresses, you know, if people come in and people are interested in learning more. And the same goes, you know, when you have an educational event or a business meeting, when that new person shows up at your business meeting and you see their eyes glossing over, somebody who's not actively involved in the conversation, pull them aside and have a conversation about why they showed up. You know, why did you come here? Why, did, why, did, why were you interested in the Green Party? Um, and get them going, you know, and try to get through, you know, get that ex little bit extra out of them that way. Um, and then there's mass agitation, right? Uh, slogans, popularizing the demands of the movement, publicity, printed materials, radios, po radio podcasts, mass meetings. Um, there's a quote from Foster, one good mass meeting is better than a dozen indifferent ones. That's really important, right? Don't just have a meeting for the sake of having a meeting. If you're going to have a meeting, make sure you're going to do the work, make sure you're ready. If you see a meeting's not going to be what you planned, don't be afraid to delay it, right? It may seem like a short-term term failure, but by taking a step back and allowing yourself the space to reorient, you can take you may be able to take multiple step forward, steps forward by having a much better event that gets you a better return. And then, as we've discussed about it previously, educational programming is another option for mass agitation, right? If you're you know, if you want to change something in your community, one of the first steps you need to take is to educate your community about why change needs to occur. Um, so that, that's a key part of mass uh, agitation. Um, because this is, you know, the green organizing, so <laughs> green socialist organizing project, and we're talking about, you know, organizing independent socialist and green party, um, you know, endeavors and chapters and, and uh, various organizations. Um, we do want to touch just a, a bit on uh, organizing and elections. Uh, the balance between movement and organizing work has always been a tactical struggle for the left in the United States. Um, the Green Party in the past has actually split into two parties uh, over this in the past. It was the GPUSA versus the, uh, which obviously is the Green Party USA versus the ASGP, which is the Association of Green Parties. Um, but they actually voted to split off from the Green Party of the United States, uh, who they felt was too involved in movement organizing and not focused enough on electoral organizing. Um, the funny part about that was it was GPUSA who was actually electing candidates uh, successfully, but ASGP split, and then it all came back together with the formation of the Green Party of the United States uh, years later. Um, so when we're talking about organizing in elections, we cannot see it as an either or debate but two parts of, an, of a larger organizing strategy, right? Electoral campaigns have a finite lifespan. They have a beginning and an ending. That means when the campaign ends, everything generally dissipates. Even if it's a recurring campaign that they know they're gonna run again in two years, there's two years where they're most likely taking off, taking a break, slowing down, right? So when these campaigns, and campaigns are often 
um, major vehicles of new engagement for Greens and independent socialists, right? When when we have a candidate running for something, that's when people are paying often paying a little bit more attention, and we get new people. But then the campaign ends, and they just kind of float off without the gravitational pull of the party to keep them there. So we've got to make sure when we're, if we're running electoral campaigns or we're running issue campaigns with finite life lifespans that we're consciously thinking about and strategizing how to get people, you know, from that campaign into the permanent party. Because while electoral campaigns are, you know, or any kind of campaign tends to have a finite lifespan, the party is the long-term vehicle. Right. The party organization is how this thing keeps going year after year, decade after decade. Um, it's just, like I said, it's essential for Greens to be able to transition supporters and volunteers from the campaign to the party and active movement work can provide that space. Right. So when we're talking about movement work versus electoral work in between elections is where movement work keeps us moving. Right. It's where it gives us things to keep going. When those, when December 2024 hits, what's your local chapter going to be doing? Um, it probably is going to be taking a, a, a well-deserved breather after a what is sure to be a brutal presidential cycle and brutal campaign cycle. But then what are you going to start doing? How are you going to start organizing into 2025? Um, and the answer to that isn't likely to be electoral, right? You need to be getting involved in movements that can continue fighting for the things that you campaigned for. Um, and then a key element of a successful campaign is having trust and re relationships in the community. Um, the ongoing nature of issues in community organizing via a party can help establish that foundation and build a base. So when you get people coming in, um, you know, when when you have new people, you need that you need to get them moving into that you know uh, into that party organization. But it's uh, um, so yeah, you need to get them moving into that party organization. I lost where I was going with that for a second, but um, and that's how we survive. That's how we grow. Right. Otherwise, it's just a, a jump start and a drop off, a jump start and a drop off, and a jump start and a drop off, and that makes it really hard to grow. So we've got to make that transition. Um, and I remember where I was going with that now, but uh, you know, one thing that this thinking about this is two parts of the larger organizing strategy, as opposed to either or, is that when we're organizing a movement, we're going to likely very quickly identify people who are leaders who. That, sh that person should be running for city council on this issue, right? We're going to find our candidates and our, when we're running electoral program or electoral you know, races, the movement can help form our base, right? So they feed off of each other. As you're mo organizing in that movement, you're identifying leaders, you're building the relationships needed to then run an effective campaign. And when you're campaigning, movements provide collaboration opportunities to grow your base um, and to, to increase your support. Um, one thing that we've had in here since one of our early ones is organizing as an introvert. Um, it often feels like, you know, a lot of what I've talked about is knocking on your neighbor's door, um, you know, things like that, speaking publicly. And that's not necessarily something that everyone is comfortable with. Um, then I will say maybe you can get comfortable with it, right? I've known people who are traditionally introverted who really found their groove, um, you know, once they once they got comfortable. Um, so I would say, you know, don't just say no, right? Um, be open to trying some things out, being learned be open to mentorship but at the same time we can't expect everyone to take those you know that active role step so we've got kind of like how we need to provide multiple levels of engagement we've got to have a way um you know for people with different comfort levels to get involved um we've also got to find a way to make our our meetings accessible to a uh, you know a large different a large group of different people um so hold my move hold meetings online, right? So if you're having a meeting in person, make sure it's available online too. And that can help the introverts, but that can also help the parents, right? That can also help the, the person that doesn't have a vehicle. That can also help the person who is just busy that night, but they could be there on the phone and at least listen in. Um, so make sure if we're doing something, it's at least hybrid. Um, you know, and, and having have, and having the ability 
like through chat rooms, through communications platforms, to continue to organize between meetings, right? The real organizing happens between meetings. If you're only organizing in two hour long meetings once a month, you're not doing effective organizing. Um, make sure you're providing written feedback ahead of an in-person meeting. Um, you know, so if I can't be there, and I've done this before where I couldn't be at a meeting, I've sent the message, I vote this on this thing we're going to be talking about, and here's my reason. And they read it out, and some people listen and care, and some people don't, but my voice is still heard as a member of the organization, even though I couldn't be physically in a space at a specific time, because that's an unrealistic expectation for people, especially, again, when we're working with the working class, you know, when we're organizing in the working class. Um, it also provides the opportunity, if you don't feel comfortable speaking in front of the group, you can write it out, send it, and it can be shared by the facilitator, and they don't even necessarily have to name you. Um, but then there's also lots of other places that people can, you know, get involved. If you don't want to show up, you can support by doing graphic design for flyers or social media. You can copyright. You can but fundraising. Copywriting is an art that the Green Party sorely lacks skilled members with, right? So if you can write in that kind of cheerleader, please donate to us voice that I, that a lot of us don't have, <clears throat> you can be a huge asset from behind the scenes, administrative work, data work, you know, all kinds of things um, that can be done behind the scenes that don't require someone to put themselves out there, um, whether that be for comfort levels or, or availability levels or whatever. Um, when running a meeting in person, um, meet for some specific activity and not just meeting to meet, right? Um, and then we can also put together kind of alternative ways to get involved that aren't the traditional education, you know, political education, rally, business meeting, right? We can do neighborhood cleanups. We can do tree plantings. We can, um, if there's a rally coming up, right? So there's a rally coming up. I don't feel comfortable going to that rally. I know there's going to be hundreds of people there. It's really going to trigger, you know, my agoraphobia. But what I could get together to do is, you know, two nights before hang out in somebody's apartment, you know, talk with some friends, talk with some comrades, have a good time and paint signs for other people to use, right? Have a game night just to build those relationships. Because again, relationships and trust, not only with the outside community, but with your own members. Um, so you, we need to make sure that people are welcome, feel welcome and wanted in the movement. Um, and as an, or if you're an organizer, consider how to make your organizations more inclusion, uh, inclusive with decision-making and involvement. Um, so to close up, night buddy, I'll be there in a minute. Sorry, toddler. So to close off, uh, you know, at the end of this workshop, I kind of want to loop back around uh, in a similar fashion to the affirmations at the beginning. Um, some ten, so 10 things to remember while organizing. Uh, these are from Krasner's Going For It, How to Run a Grassroots Election Campaign and Win. So again, this was specifically about grassroots elections. Um, but it really, these top 10 things can be applied to community organizing, to really any aspect of what we do. So a lot of times when, you know, thinking about grassroots organizing, you're going to have to take in, a, you know, a source and a little bit out of context and adapt it to your needs. But 10 things to remember in organizing. You will make mistakes. Do your pr best to pr correct them and move on. I repeat, you will make mistakes, right? We're forging a new path. We're, we're doing things differently. And that means there are going to be missteps. But what we can't do is get in our heads. We can't quit because that didn't work out. We have to say, why didn't that work out? What did we do wrong? What did we miss, right? It, in my experience, um, most of the time when something doesn't go to plan, uh, we, we know why. Uh, if, it did, if you don't know why, you need to really dig on that, right? What did we miss? Why were we blindsided by this? Um, because, it, it, again, it's showing a very big blinder in your organizing, most likely. Um, so you will make mistakes, correct it, and move on, right? Chin up, get up off the mat, and go back for the next round. Assume nothing, follow through on everything, check and double check. Um, you know, if, if something's supposed to happen, don't necessarily assume that it will. Um, oftentimes we kind of let people work in their silos and we assume that they're fine, but they may not be fine, right? So check in, you know, as you're coming up like, hey, how's the press release going? And they may say, fine, ready to go out tomorrow. And then that's great. 
Um, and they may say, man, I'm really struggling. I, I, you know, my kid was sick. I've worked, you know, 70 hours at work this week because of the looming project. And I'm really struggling. And then, you know, to jump in or they could say, hey, I, you know, I'm really struggling. I've just got writer's block on this. I've had that right where I'm like, I, I, I just can't write this thing right now. I don't know why, but I can't. Can someone help me? Right. But people aren't always comfortable asking why. So make sure you're reaching out. Right. Double check with people. Hey, how are things going? Um, make sure that people aren't just left in their silos and assumed to be OK. Uh, provide that you know broad based support throughout your organization. Um, make decisions. Greens, make decisions. Don't agonize and don't wait for a perfect solution. Um, I've seen too many great ideas pulled apart uh, to the point of just dying. Uh, because of people wanted that perfect solution and it doesn't exist. Perfection is, you know, I guess in some ways a, a noble goal to strive for, um, but it's setting yourself up for failure, right? So make decisions, don't agonize about it, move forward. No, you're going to make mistakes. Maybe that decision was a mistake. Maybe it wasn't. As long as you move, learn from it and move forward, you're good. Um, campaigning is a social process. People like to be asked for help and thanked for help, right? It should be fun, right? It's hard work. Political organizing and community organizing is exhausting, thankless, hard work. But you should be having some fun. You should be having some enjoyment. You should be getting some, you know, something from the relationships that you're building. It's a social process. Um, don't forget that. In small races, the personal personal will usually dominate. Issue ma issues matters more as size of the campaign grows, right? And this is why when we talked about relational organizing, you start by asking people how are you know how things are with them, right? What are they thinking, and then you help make those connections, right? Because it's gonna, the per the thing that will motivate them is most likely a personal thing, right? That's how you find out that oh my neighbor is gonna be ride or die. Um, you know, when it comes to universal health care, because they watched a family member, you know, just go into devastating debt at the end of their life. Um, you know, and, and I, if you didn't have that, those conversations and build that trust, you might not know that to know like, hey, you should be coming out to my our Medicare for all of it, you know, because I know you really care about this. Um, so if personal is going to dominate in, in small, you know, smaller races and smaller organizing um, activities, then you've got to do the work to be personal, right? To know those things. Uh, the campaign that keeps on the offensive without being offensive will usually win. Um, really important when doing anything, the, we live in a dynamic and chaotic world. Um, and while we must respond to it in some way, uh, we also have, can't let it derail us, right? Um, so we don't need to, you know, while hot takes and edgelord stuff will get you lots of reactions on, on Twitter, uh, tweet, retweets don't vote, likes don't vote, um, you know, being a, putting out a positive vision about how to, you know, realize real change is what will actually inspire people. Um, and so, you know, keep that in mind that, you know, you need to keep moving forward on your goals. You need to put that positive vision out there. Um, and you need to make sure you're not derailed and pulled into the mud. Um, all politics is local. Translate issues into local terms. You know, like I said earlier, what climate action means in different places is different. Um, you know, even within the same state. Um, you know, we, we, and where I'm from in Illinois, uh, when we were fighting about fracking years ago, um, you know, all the fracking is going to happen downstate, but 80% of the population lives upstate. And they didn't care about fracking because it wasn't a local issue. And that's why we couldn't get a much moratorium passed, right? The large uh, environmental groups were all based out of metropolitan areas that weren't in danger of fracking. And they frankly didn't care what happened uh, to the rural folks. Um, it wasn't on top on their issue. They were more worried about, you know, um, you know, coal ash and things like that coming from plants. They were more worried about um, the 22,000 tons of, you um, nuclear waste that Illinois has with nowhere to store, right? Um, because those are closer issues to their home. So make sure we're translating issues back in. If you want to talk about the climate, how does that work? How does that manifest in your community? If you want to talk about police brutality, how does that manifest in your community? Um, make sure that you are taking these broader themes that we all talk about and that are so important to us and making them real to people on, you know, in their community. And then one campaign does not make or break a movement. A losing campaign can provide the basis for winning the next time. This is absolutely true 
whether it be electoral or just movement organizing, right? You learn from those failures, right? You learn and, and, and fail. I don't even want to use the, the term failure. We have to recalibrate what success means when grassroots organizing, right? Um, that first race, maybe get into five. For, and so in Illinois, if you're if you can get your partisan race to five percent, that means you're recognized on the ballot for the next election. That means you have to collect way less signatures and you just made it easier for you to campaign the next time, right? That's a victory. That first 5% threshold is a victory. And on the federal level, it means that if our presidential candidate gets 5%, that we get party, we get federal funding for our uh, primary process in the next election, right? That's millions of dollars that we don't have right now. Um, you know, it, it, it may not even be a threshold like that. It may be, hey, we do that campaign doubled our membership. Right. And so now we're ready to take that campaign on more seriously next time around, or we're ready to pivot to this campaign that we might have a better chance at. Um, so make, it does, one campaign doesn't make or break a loop movement. These are stepping stones. These are learning opportunities. These are, you know, a, a just moving down the path. Um, campaigns should be fun. Look out for each other and avoid burnout. I talked about that a little earlier. Um, and then finally, a campaign is a chance to show who you are and what you are in favor of. Use every opportunity to show how our grassroots campaigns are different from politics as usual and the two major parties, right? Um, we, you know, the majority of Medicare for all advocates in this country voted in 2020 for someone who said they would veto Medicare for all. The, the majority of people who wanted peace voted for a half century long imperialist, right? Um, and they vote, and that's because of we, we have in America what I call a negative voting, cult, voting culture in our mainstream politics. People tend to vote against something rather than for it. And you can, uh, Eugene Debs said he'd rather vote for, he'd rather vote for what he wants and not get it than vote for what he doesn't want and get it. Um, and I think that's very, you know, a very apt uh, quote to summer, you know, to accompany this this last bullet point. Um, you know, the idea that when we're running these campaigns, when we're organizing in our community, we need to be putting forward a positive, you know, pro our issues message and agenda. Um, we cannot, we, we've seen the results of left, lesser evilism by looking at our, our mainstream politics. We've seen what voting against your interests because you really don't like the other guy um, gets us. So, um, you know, that's something we need to keep in, keep in mind as we're orienting our campaigns, whether they're electoral or community-based. And um, yeah, so with that, that is the end of the workshop for tonight. Um, like I said, you can go to greensocialist.net slash 101s, um, and you can see all these old ones. If, if you like this organizing 101, but you wish it went a little deeper, um, we've got hours of content up there. We've got one, we've got one from 22 that's just on how to revitalize a local that's kind of went stagnant. We've got a whole other one that's a couple hours long on how to start a new local from scratch if one doesn't exist. Um, I, like I said earlier, when someone asked in the chat, uh, the slideshow for this uh, will be up um, in the next day or two on on that website, greensocialist.net slash 101s. Uh, the pod, it'll be out on podcast platforms Thursday morning, and uh, you can find it where you're watching it now on Facebook and uh, YouTube, no problem. Um, and then before I go, one more time, I'm going to put into the chat. As we head into 2024, we want to know what you're interested in in terms of seeing this 101 series evolve. Um, so we have a uh, survey that you can take. Tell us, you know, what you want to hear, what kind of issues you want to hear about. Um, you know, if you, there are guests you'd like to see, if their format changes, all of that. Um, but with that, thank you very much, um, and have a. Well, we'll see you in twenty twenty four. Have a good new year.